morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We hope you consider this your church home and will come back often. First, we'd like to offer a loving goodbye to our awesome Baldoff family. What is Peoria's loss is most definitely Escanaba, Michigan's game. Dr. Walt, best of luck. Sonia, Dean, Bruce, you will be missed. In accordance with phase three of the reopening Illinois guidelines, some small groups have begun meeting. On Wednesdays, 10 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. respectively, Pastor Rob is offering a Bible study on the Book of Psalms, a morning book club, one of the mugs group, and a movie club have also resumed meeting. We still have room for a few more, so contact the church office or our website at fbcpeoria.org for more information. Even more exciting news, starting Sunday, July 19th, services will resume in the sanctuary. At this point, all necessary safeguards are being established. More information will be forthcoming. Have a great day. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, this year has not been easy on any of us. We are all seeing things we never wanted to see and experiencing hardships we never knew we would have to deal with. Please cover this earth with your divine healing and perfect peace. We are praying that July welcomes us all with a whole new light and a whole new way of being. Respect, love, and kindness to all people. We are praying for health and calmness to cover this earth far and wide. We pray as we all believe you hear and will deliver. In the words our Savior taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. In everything do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow, and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Good morning, friends. Have you ever wanted
wanted to do something hard, but you were afraid to try. This week's story is about a girl who is also afraid to try new things. It's from the book, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, and it's about a girl named Jessica Watson. Once upon a time, there was a girl called Jessica who was afraid of water. One summer morning, Jessica was playing with her sisters and cousins by the pool. At one point, the other children lined up on the side and got ready to jump in together, holding hands. Jessica's mom watched from the window to make sure Jessica was okay. She expected Jessica to step back from the side, but was amazed to see her daughter step forward with the others. One, two, three, splash. All the kids landed in the water, shouting and laughing. From that day on, Jessica started loving the water. She joined a sailing club and decided to sail around the world on her own without stopping. She painted her boat bright pink and named it Ella's Pink Lady. She packed the boat with steak and kidney pies, potatoes, cans and cans of beans, 150 bottles of milk, and lots of water, and set sail from Sydney Harbor. She was just 16 years old. All on her own, Jessica sailed onward. She fought against waves as tall as skyscrapers. She woke up to the most beautiful sunrises, spotted blue whales, and watched shooting stars above her boat. Seven months later, she arrived back in Sydney. Thousands of people turned out to greet her. They rolled out a special carpet for her, bright pink, just like her boat. Just like Jessica overcame her fears to do hard things, you can do hard things too. Jessica Watson says, you don't have to be someone special to achieve something amazing. You've just got to have a dream, believe in it, and work hard. Have a great week. Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Today, our pastoral reading comes out of the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. Hear now a reading from Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. Listen closely. Sin has no dominion over you, because you are not under the law, but instead you are under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have, be, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, hear now our prayers. For our friends, family, and church community, for those in the hospital, for those preparing for surgery, we pray for health, healing, and recovery. For our city, our country, and our world, may mercy rain down from heaven. May hope rain down from heaven. May love rain down from heaven. For the parents that are preparing, for the unemployed 
that are job hunting, for the doctors and nurses that are serving, for the volunteers that are sacrificing, for the pantries that are feeding, for the children that are persevering, for the churches that are giving. We pray mercy, O Lord. We pray comfort, O Lord. We pray thanks, O Lord. By your radical grace and radiant love, we pray. Amen. I'll be the first to admit that I don't really care for the slave language that's found in our Romans passage today. It makes me uncomfortable. It goes against the grain. I don't, 
I don't like using slave language to describe anything about our relationship with God. And so if it makes you uncomfortable, if, if, if you're hearing it and, and you don't know how to react to that, then I'm with you and I understand that. I mean, you'd think that after 2,000 years of time, after all of that time passing by, that now in today's world that slave language would be foreign to us, that it would be hard to understand, or at least somewhat vague, but that's just not the case. It's not where we are. The truth is that that's probably why we have so much pain in the world. That's probably where most of the darkness comes from, that we have still not been able to overcome this darkest side of what it means to be human. The side that wants to treat others as non-human, to treat others as if they weren't created in the very image of God. And until we get over that, until we start seeing one another as fellow humans, as fellow children of God, as fellow image bearers of God, until we do that, we will be wandering in the dark. But there is light. The light is found in learning to love one another. Now, Paul's goal, I, I believe that it was not to support slavery, not, not necessarily. Let me give it that caveat. Honestly, Paul would have no possible idea, no, no understanding of a world without slavery because it had never existed. Everywhere he looked, he saw slavery. Still, I think that his goal in using slave language was meant to be a, a literary tool to help us understand our connections to sin and to righteousness. And he paints a, a haunting picture that leaves us either chained to darkness or chained to light. The path, at least as Paul describes it, is right before you. You have the choice of which road you're going to take. You have the narrow path and you have the wide path. You have two gates, two roads, the road of righteousness or the road of sin and death. It's a scene that leaves the reader awestruck, jaw-dropped, wondering which way they'll go, which path they'll take, which road they're going to journey on. If you ever have the chance to find your way to the other side of the world and travel through the magnificent country of Egypt, I, I highly recommend going to visit the pyramids. Now, that, that may sound a bit obvious. I get that. If you go to Egypt, you're probably going to visit the pyramids. But there are a lot of tourist stops in the world. And, and sometimes something can be so famous that when you get there, you're kind of like, oh, that's, that's what it is. A lot of people describe that feeling when they go see the Mona Lisa, for example, because it's a very small painting, but it's also very famous. And so when you arrive, even though it is beautiful and it's amazing and it's this elegant masterpiece, it's a very, very small painting and it tends to surprise people. I want to say that the pyramids are not that. They will not disappoint you in that way. If you find yourself over there, you should go see the pyramids. Their sheer size and the way that they, that they dot the horizon as far as the eye can see and, and the number of them will leave you jaw dropped. When you get close, the stones, the stones of the Great Pyramid, uh, which is the one you'd probably go see, the stones that are used to build it are so large they're like cars or pickup trucks. They're just, it's not what I expected to see. They're enormous and they're stunning. And if you get the chance and you're, and you're not too claustrophobic, then you should go inside the pyramid. Take the, the small tunnel that descends deep into the pyramid's heart to find the hidden queen's chamber. Many of the pyramids have hidden chambers or rooms or galleries. They're, they're hard to find. They have very narrow pathways. Um, they're usually pretty hidden. They also 
often have other rooms that are, are large pathways that are really barely hidden. They're kind of hidden, but only barely. And they're a lot easier to find. And they're broad, and they're open, and you would never feel claustrophobic going into one of those pathways. The wide paths and the pyramids are, are easy to walk through. And ultimately, when you get to the end of them, typically you find little to nothing there. It's a... Uh, well, it's really kind of a clever ploy and an ancient security system, you might call it, to trick grave robbers into thinking that there's nothing there to be stolen. But if you want to find the real history, if you want to go on the true adventure, then you have to take the narrow path, the harder path, the hidden one. The tunnel to the queen's chamber requires that you that you hunch down really low. You have to crouch as you walk. You descend for a long time trying to keep your balance on the uneven terrain of carved stone. The tunnel is arduous. It's dark and it's exhausting. No light gets in there. It's so dark that you, you have to bring light with you or you just rely on the lanterns that are there from the excavation. And at its conclusion, it opens up into this vast hidden chamber deep in the stone heart of the pyramid. And it's in that hidden space right there as you, as you have traveled down and you're finally opening up to this large space that you find that it's just as humbling and just as stunning as standing outside of the pyramid at its face. Two paths, two roads, one far easier than the other, but the narrow path, the narrow path is the real adventure. You're going to find that life is full of roads, and each road leads to another road, each one weaving and guiding you along your path. And some paths are easier than others. Some roads are a lot simpler. They have more room, they have a lot less obstacles, but those broad roads are rarely the roads that lead to righteousness. Paul talks about the dueling relationship between sin and righteousness, and it's a constant in all of his work, especially in the book of Romans. And his chief concern in our passage is ensuring that we don't find ourselves chained to the wrong cause or to the wrong road or to the wrong life. In Paul's worldview, everyone is chained to something. Everywhere he went, everywhere anyone went in the first century world, you would have seen people with masters one way or the other. Born a slave? Well, then you, of course, had a master. Some people sold themselves into slavery to pay off debt. Others were forced into slavery as a result of criminal punishment, whether they were guilty or not. But even the free weren't necessarily free. The first century Israelite people were bound under the, the, cor the corrupt oppression of Rome. They had to pay taxes to a foreign power. They had to answer to the rulers of that foreign power. They had to answer to the soldiers of that foreign oppressor. They had to bow before the emperor. And even in religion, Paul saw it. Even in his own faith. With his eyes opened by the power of Christ, he walked around with new sight and he could see that people were enslaved to a law that Christ had already fulfilled. Everyone chained to something. So Paul describes a different road. One that's, that's not bound to sin or selfishness or greed or hate. This road was bound to righteousness alone and all the goodness that came with it. Two roads, one harder and one easier, one chained to sin and one bound to righteousness one narrow and one broad. And I'll admit, the easier path is, well, the easier path is, is easier, to put it simply. It comes with 
a lot less risk, a lot less social, physical, or monetary sacrifice. But that easier, broad path is very rarely the path that leads to us being the Christ-like givers of grace that we are called to be. When a colleague or a friend makes a comment that is demeaning or sexist or racist maybe, and we say nothing or we laugh at it, that's the wide path. Yeah, it's easier. It's less complicated. But it is not righteous. When we consistently choose to avoid self-examination, being honest about our faults and our prejudices and the things that hold us back in life, when we refuse to walk in someone else's shoes, when we refuse to acknowledge that there is some scenario where we could actually be wrong about something, well, yeah, it's a lot easier. It's less complicated. But it's not righteous. When we allow children to go hungry or families to live in hopeless poverty or minority people groups to be silenced, mocked, or beaten, then we're taking the broad road, the wide path. And it's certainly less complicated for us, but it is not righteous. It's wrong. The road to righteousness requires that we end the oppression of all people. That's why Christ calls us to enter through the narrow gate. Even though the road is hard, it is the road that leads to life. That's what we heard in our reading from Matthew chapter 7 today. The kingdom of God isn't found at the end of the easy path. It's not the large, easy tomb to find. The kingdom of God is down the narrow path. It's rocky, uneven, and small. Few find it. You have to, to hunch down just to fit through the gate. You have to walk with humility and not stand proud of yourself all the time. You have to bring light with you because it's, it's dark down there. And that's okay because our God has ensured, has made you the light of the world bright and shining and glorious for all to see. So you bring light along the narrow path. And it takes time. It takes time. The, the pathway descends and seems to last forever. You're going to have to sacrifice to reach its end because it's a long tunnel to get into the heart of the pyramid because it descends into the heart of a mountain. And isn't that what we're all looking for? Really, in our lives, the heart of a mountain, the heart of God, that's what we're searching for. That's the path we're on. The new Jerusalem, the place where peace, justice, grace, and equality reign forever, all of them flowing like rivers coming out of God's love and mercy. It's time to replace our addictive, destructive, sinful roads with new ones, with roads that are positive, edifying, and just. To replace evil and darkness with light and goodness. That's the stuff that we need to be doing with our time and energy because we are called to walk through the narrow gate, to find ourselves on a new road, on the kind of road that leads to righteousness. May we all answer that call. May each and every one of us find ourselves traveling through the narrow gate and binding ourselves to the way of righteousness. Let us pray. Precious God, hear our prayers. Help us to be people that love others, that serve others, that care for others. Help us to be people 
that care about journeying down the road of righteousness, that hear the words of Paul and allows them to, to guide us in our lives. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Higher Ground. so glad that you chose to worship with us today. If you live in the Peoria area, we'd love to meet you in person as time allows for that to happen. We have new small groups starting up all the time and it's been great to see so many of your faces recently, um, even when you're wearing the mask. It's good to be together and I, I look forward to each and every moment that we can do that in a safe and responsible way. But until we can do it fully, just keep serving, keep loving one another, keep looking out for each other, and keep being Christ in the world. Let me pray for you for our benediction. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, your children. Amen. Go in peace.